see now everybody talks at once. Okay. <laughs> Welcome, you guys. Okay. So, if you were not here last week, uh, we started designing, per somebody's uh, suggestion, a Rotary Union. And we played a video on, on what a Rotary Union is. And then uh, I started uh, sketching it, conceptualizing it. Uh, I would like your, your, your help, your participation. This is where we left off, just the, the concept barely started starting to come together. Um, we're gonna keep going with the concept and then put it into Onshape in CAD. And the idea is that all of you in the room hopefully already Onshape account and we can do multiple things at once. So you, you guys will help design this Rotary Union. We'll do it all together, okay? There are a number of parts um, that can be designed. I'm thinking that um, uh, each one of you is going to get assigned a part, a component to the Rotary Union, and you'll design it, and then we'll bring it all together uh, into a final design. Hopefully, we move quickly enough, and there are no technical issues, and we can actually complete this design in under, under two hours or under an hour and a half, something like that. Okay. Uh, who wasn't here last week and didn't see the Rotary Union video that we played? Um, who's fun with uh, danger disaster in, I think, uh, 1996? Uh, the Challenger that um, it took off from Earth and then it exploded. There was a technical issue. Who's familiar with that? And, Who's familiar with the exact details as to as to why it failed? I think, uh, given that the um, Rotary Union that we're designing includes uh, O-rings or seals, I think it's important to touch on that. It's a very interesting uh, aspect of seal design. <clears throat> okay, no one said anything, so I suppose none of you are familiar with it, uh, which which is a good thing. You'll be seeing it for the first time. Uh, let me. I'm going to load up a video for us, but first I want to tell you, describe to you, uh, sort of where I'm headed with this. Um, So when you design a seal, let's see, let's pull up uh, an image here first. I want to say O-ring uh, gland design. I'm going to look for images. Okay, something like something like this one, perhaps. Okay, so you can see the O-rings, they're of circular cross-section. Uh, you can see how this design was implemented. The, the O-ring gland, that's the, the groove for the O-ring, but it's usually called the gland. Uh, the one on the right is on the female part, on the female component, and it's a, a, a female gland, uh, an internal gland. Uh, and you can see this close-ups over here. Okay, this is actually good. Um, this kind of gives you an idea. Here's what I wanted to talk about. It gives you an idea of uh, what happens under pressure. So the idea is to seal, right? To not let gas or liquid uh, get past the seal. So what happens is that the gland is designed to be bigger than the cross-section of the o-ring or of the seal that way it has room to move and expand and deform so the gland is bigger as you can see here now once once the seal is exposed to pressure uh, that's sneaking in through that uh, through that cavity there uh, the seal is going to move from one position to the other it's going to move to another side and it's going to deform because pressure is being applied to it it's going to deform and it's going to create a better seal. So it has um, sort of a, focus on the image on the left. I just realized the two on the right talk about backup rings. Uh, 
We'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. But the image on the left only, uh, you can see that when pressure was applied uh, from the right side, the seal probably moved to the left and it's sitting against the left and it's going to deform and, um, and put a sealing uh, seal right there. Okay, this is what I wanna talk about before we I show you the video of uh, Challenger. Uh, maybe I should, let's see. <clears throat> okay, so you've got the external part and you have the gland. And for now, let's assume that this is a, a static situation. So uh, neither the outside nor the inside is turning or moving axially. It's just a seal that is static. There's no, these two parts are not moving in relation to each other. Okay, so originally you have your seal when it's first installed. Uh, that's not very good. It'll be something like that with some partial compression. Uh, then pressure is going to come in and is going to push uh, on the surface. It's going to move the, the seal to the left. So now let me erase this. This is sort of an, a very crude animation for you guys. So it's going to move to the left and it's going to push it something like that perhaps okay because of the pressure it shifts to the left now gland design and the clearance so these dimensions here uh, the clearance right here between this and this uh, the width of the gland the height of the gland which is let's do it this way uh, even even uh, the radii right there or the, uh, the sharp edges are removed. All of that is fairly critical, especially in a high pressure application. Okay, so in a rotary union also, like if, you have a, if you're designing a rotary union that's capable of withstanding 6,000 PSI, uh, you would pay very close attention to the seal design. Okay, anyway, this is happening here, right? So the seal is gonna move left when pressure comes into the right. If the dimensions are not correct, or if the pressure is just extremely high, this could start uh, deforming and actually going into that area right there. There are different failure modes that could take place. Okay, so let's watch this video on Challenger. Um, and you'll see how, well, we'll come back and talk about it, but it, it specifically has to do with seal design and a failure, uh, they didn't pay attention to certain things. And unfortunately, people actually died uh, when this accident happened. Okay, let me load up the video. Um, I think it's gonna be a good lecture. Uh, sorry to start on a, on a note where there was a disaster involved, but I think it's critical for us to know these kinds of things. The Challenger disaster occurred in January of 86. Probably most of the students in this class weren't born at that time, but it is important to understand how traumatic it was. I'm Jeff Hoffman, professor of aerospace engineering at MIT in the Aero Astro Department. Uh, prior to coming here, I was a NASA astronaut for 19 years, made five flights on the space shuttle. My second flight as it was originally scheduled, would have been the very next flight after the Challenger uh, disaster. Before going into the simulator, I took a look at the uh, pictures from the launch pad, saw all the icicles hanging, and said to myself, oh, well, no way they're going to launch today. It's much too cold. 
unfortunately, uh, the managers who were making the decision of whether or not they should launch on that day, they didn't really appreciate the, the temperature sensitivity. I came out of the simulator when they began the final T-9 countdown and we were expecting to see the shuttle get launched and then we'd go back into the simulator to uh, continue our training. Engine start, four, three, two, one, and lift off. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Challenger, go at throttle up. Challenger, go at throttle up. At 11.39 Eastern, twice the speed of sound, the Challenger's fuselage breaks apart from the inside out. America's space program suffers its first fatalities in flight. What first went through most of our minds is uh, maybe it's a main engine problem. It wasn't until several weeks later that all of the discussions about the O-ring came out. There was a groove which the O-ring, both the primary and the secondary O-rings, fit in those grooves uh, and there was a little flange and tang that, that they came together and the, the, in order to stop the gas from, from going around and, and escaping, when the initial uh, bit of gas hit the first primary O-ring, that pressure would push the O-ring into the little space between the, the flange and the tang, and that would make the seal. In other words, the O-ring was not in a sealing configuration when it was just sitting statically on the launch pad. It has to move dynamically at the moment of ignition to be able to make the seal and the requirement for it to move quickly is why it was dependent on temperature because lower temperatures, less flexibility and not so rapid reconfiguration of the O-ring. My name is Michael Rubner and I'm a professor in the material science department and my specialty is polymers. These engineers should have known and um, probably most likely knew that if they dropped below a certain temperature, they were going into a, a temperature regime that was going to be quite dangerous in terms of the performance of that material. If we think about the crystalline state and we try to capture what's going on in terms of phase transitions during that state, if we have polymer chains, those polymer chains, at least segments of them, are going to be aligned and organized into highly ordered segments. So this is what you'd normally expect for the crystalline state, a three-dimensionally three ordered structure. If we now take the temperature so that it's greater than the melting transition, and we did a snapshot of, of the chain organization, what you would see, in fact, that the chains are now highly disordered. It becomes like spaghetti-like structure. And in fact, they're able to move around and slide past each other very easily. That's a very clear phase transition that's easily discernible. If we're in the amorphous state, which is the state that is characterized by the glass transition temperature, if I were to take a picture of the chains below the glass transition temperature and take a picture of the chains above the glass transition temperature, and I were to draw them just on the board as I did here, you wouldn't be able to tell any difference. There'd be no change in the volume between these two different states, very little change. There'd be no change in um, the average distance between the molecules. So when we go to a temperature T greater than Tg, from this perspective, we can't really see a, a phase transition of the type that we see in the crystalline phase transition. However, if we're able to take a movie picture of these chains and, and automatically be able to see what's going on there, here below the glass transition temperature, the, chain, the, temperature, the chains would be in this frozen uh, state, to be basically locked in place. When you get above the glass transition temperature, however, if this were a movie, we'd be able to see that the chains are sliding past each other. Segments 20, 30, 40 carbons long are, are activated and moving around, and that provides them the flexibility they need to, for example, behave as a good O-ring. In terms of the space shuttle, I think uh, the glass transition temperature is an easily characterized parameter, parameter. One can use a technique called differential scanning calorimetry, for example, to know exactly where that temperature is. Um, therefore, you have a pretty good idea of what temperatures you want to keep away from in terms of this material transitioning from this very resilient, flexible state, which is obviously needed for an O-ring, to this very brittle state where the material is not going to respond and change very well. To find out that uh, safety had been compromised in the way it was, through a lack of understanding and a lack of communication, and among many other things, uh, was 
deep, deeply, uh, it, it, it hurt us, it hurt us. All right, so uh, I think you guys were able to see the video this time. Uh, let me know if you did or didn't, uh, but it was very important for us to review that. Um, and I'm sure you understood what was happening. It, it raises, um, here, let me show this. It's a very important aspect of design and engineering. We look at things on a computer. We, we see our own sketches. We also look at things, uh, models on a computer. And we tend to not always see animations or, or um, yeah, animations of what's, what's happening. So if we only see things in two different states, like before and after, uh, something uh, very bad can happen because we're not taking into account the transition between one state to the other. And this is what I mean, uh, going back to the sketch that I have here. So I can figure out how to do this again. So if we only look um, at the initial position, and then at the final position, everything looks fine. We can just say, okay, at the initial position, it will be floating. Once pressure is applied, it's going to uh, move left and the seal is going to engage. What about the transition? We cannot ignore the transition, what's happening during the transition, getting from that semi-round state, moving to another location and deforming to provide a seal. Uh, so keep that in mind. This, is not, this, this aspect is very important. It doesn't only apply to seal design, it applies to uh, anything where you have moving parts. If you have moving parts, you can't just look at the models on the computer and see, okay, in this state it's good, in this state is good. You have to consider what happens in the transition. Are there any issues as the, as the motion is in transition? That's the point, okay? So unfortunately, very sad uh, incident in history, but they overlooked that, right? Uh, what happened is the temperature was below what it should have been. Uh, someone didn't account for the fact that at that very low temperature, the seal was going to be uh, more rigid, not as flexible as it's supposed to be. So the explosion took place. The seal was not flexible enough to do its job and the explosion just biased both seals. So very sad, but important for us engineers to be aware of such things, right? Okay, let's get back onto the uh, the concept here. And let me make sure I can see the chat in case you guys ask any questions. Okay, good. So it looks like you were able to see the video and you should be able to hear me right now. Okay, we were doing this, this concept here. If you remember, uh, we were talking about it needs to, um, let me bring this closer to me. It needs two uh, ball bearings of some bearings of whatever kind they may be. Uh, it's going to need two seals. In this case, we started off with designing a single single channel or single passage rotor union, uh, just to understand what components are needed and how it may look. Um, and then I think the the original proposal was that we design a a two channel rotor union, if I remember correctly. Okay. So this is where we left off. We have a body, the body shown in black. And this is just a very rough sketch to give us an idea what components we need and what form it's gonna take. Uh, the O-rings, the seals in this case, on the left side were, were just a representation of some sort of seal. So then knowing that ideally we use standard off the shelf components, a lot of most O-rings are circular in cross, in cross section, so we're going to try to integrate integrate a standard O-ring um, into the design. So we have the base, and we had, if you remember correctly, there's a step right there for the inner race of the ball bearing. <clears throat> so we're visualizing assembly as we go, also. So this is positioned vertically. Uh, the axis is here, 
and it's sitting there on a surface we slide uh, the bulb in, in in place and you're gonna develop your own your own way of conceptualizing conceptualizing uh, things designs but right now I'm opening up what I do, what goes through my mind as I do this. Okay, so looking on the left, once there's a ball bearing in place, we need a seal. A couple of things would be, do we want the seal on the inside, on the male portion of this component, or do we want it on the cavity? Okay, do you guys know what I mean? So let's scroll over here. Uh, do we want the seal here on the male component, or do we want the the opposite? something like that, or do we want it on the uh, female component, right? So let's quickly, uh, if you remember last week, we were looking at um, Apple Rubber is one of the good companies, uh, seal uh, manufacturer and uh, supplier. There's also, well, there are tons of them, but the ones that come to mind, Apple Rover, of course, we can always go to trusty, uh, reliable MacMaster car and look for O-rings. Uh, MacMaster is fairly good at providing some reference information sometimes, not for everything, but sometimes they do. So for now, I don't see, oh, here, about O-rings more. Let's see what they talk about here. Okay, they provide materials. On top, you see different types of materials for O-rings. You see the temperature range that is safe to use these O-rings in and what they are resistant to. Are they resistant to acids, alkalines, uh, gasoline, hydraulic oils, etc.? So you can look at this later. A solid black um, filled in circle means it's excellent, excellent for that application. Uh, half filled, it's good. And if there's no circle at all, it probably means stay away from that, don't use it, or there's no data on that. Let me see, uh, Serge is saying on the male component will be safer, I believe. Uh, yeah, I actually I actually was gonna go in that direction. Uh, to be honest, I haven't, I haven't it's been a while since I designed glands for O-rings, so I don't remember the pros and cons between uh, putting it on the female end or the male end. I do not remember. And this is fine. You're going to run into a lot of this. You're, you, we don't know everything. Uh, and even if we did something in the past, you don't necessarily remember all the details today. So this is where a good engineer is going to jump on a computer or, or pull out some reference books and do the research again evaluate the pros and cons, when should it be on the female end, when on the male, etc. cetera. Uh, and that's kind of where I was headed right now. Uh, so let's see. As I mentioned before, Apple Rover changed their website. I haven't done this in a, in a while, but here we have seal design guide. We have introduction, O-ring basics, seal types and gland, gland design. Let's check that out. And they have another menu here. What is this? Major classification. Oh, okay. So now, other things to consider uh, when you're doing seal design. Is it static or is it dynamic? For example, uh, the, what is it called? The cylinder head in, in a vehicle, in a combustion engine, you have the cylinder head and you have the, some kind of cover, the valve cover, I think it's called. So between the valve cover and the cylinder head, there's a seal all the way around, obviously, right? Uh, that seal is static. These two parts are not moving in relation to each other. 
So that seal is there, it gets compressed, it's, it's, uh, it does its job, but the two components are not moving in relation to each other. So that's a static seal application. Then you have a dynamic seal application. Obviously, uh, there are parts moving in relation to each other. And you can have rotary motion and you can have axial motion. So those parameters, those, those aspects affect the design of the gland and the selection of the seal and things like that. So in our case, we have a dynamic seal application because the rotary union is moving, uh, the two parts in relation to each other. And it's not axial, it's not linear, it's rotary. So we have a dynamic seal with rotary motion. So let's see what they say about that dynamic seal types over here. And there's reciprocating. I'm just gonna skim through this. You guys can look at it in more detail on your own time. They talk about squeeze. There's a recommended uh, amount of squeeze, preliminary squeeze on the seal uh, that is safe. <clears throat> we also have to consider that upon installation of a seal, it will be stretched. You have to make sure that there's no damage as the seal is being uh, installed or uh, here we have rotary seals, temperature limits, stretch, squeeze, rotary seal gland dimensions. Okay, uh, one second, let's see, rotary seals, illustration 4.7. Okay, in this case, it's a rotary seal application. Thank you for that little image, Apple Rover. <laughs> um, okay, here's a table. Okay, and you start to see uh, reference material. Uh, also, notice over here, since you want the seal to, um, to be reliable, right? Uh, the surface finish, uh, the surface roughness matters especially in a dynamic application. So the symbols that you, you see here are uh, surface roughness. Uh, on top, it would be the meaning on, on, on that flat, well, on top you have 16 micro inches surface finish, minimum. Uh, wait, maximum, minimum. How does that work? You want it to be smooth, 16 micro inches or smoother. That means, 16 micro inches maximum. Smoother would be eight or four micro inches. So 16 maximum. On, this, on the gland design itself, it can be a 32 micro inch uh, maximum surface roughness. Okay, and you probably know about that. Uh, it can have a draft or, or maybe without a draft is also acceptable, but only between zero and five degrees in general. And you have your dimensions here. Okay, this is just a quick overview. Um, all right. So you would go through all this and you see all the, all the sizes that are available. Right now we're at the conceptual stage still, but, but I'm starting to gather information that's relevant that will affect the concept, okay? Well, and at the same time, I'm giving you an overview. So uh, we call them AS numbers. I don't, I don't remember what that stands for but AS-568, I think is the standard uh, that drives seal-related uh, matters. And you go by number, like a dash 026, and you will get the dimensions for that particular O-ring. The ID, the width, and the OD as a reference, because the width drives the OD. <clears throat> they also provide uh, the manufacturing tolerances for the shaft, the groove, the rod, the groove width, all the dimensions that you need, including the manufacturing tolerance, which is critical, depending on the, on the seriousness of the application. All right, going back to this then, uh, I think I'm gonna agree with search. Let's do it on, on, the, on the male component, just, just as I sketch it here on the right. So coming back to this, Feel free to jump in with suggestions or questions. Uh, 
So I need a seal after the ball bearing. So I'm going to just represent the male gland here. And let's just drop it in there. Um, okay. Uh, what else happens here? After the seal, we create a path for for the uh, gas or liquid, right? So as I sketched it on the left, we can already imagine that we're, we're going to be drilling on the side of this round component. We're going to drill at 90 degrees to create a path, a passage. Okay, and as we go, I may make some mistakes, uh, not only because I'm human, but also on purpose, so that you see how these things uh, develop. But if you catch the mistakes, if you see something I'm doing wrong, please let me know. Okay, so then what happens after that? We have another seal. Okay, so let me bring this down a touch. So after... After the passage, we have another seal like this. Um, okay. We have to seal both sides of the passage. Then after that, we can have the other O-ring that's going to support this. I, I'm sorry, ball bearing. Now, remember a ball bearing? has two, two races, inner race, outer race. We have to provide some positive means to support the races. During installation, they're gonna sit. On the bottom, we have a, a shoulder, which is a step. We call them shoulders to support the inner race. We can similar thing on the upper one. So I would do a small step. for the other ball bearing. Let me move this somewhere else. If I can, let's see, how can I drag this? Come on, go, 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 go. All right, nice. Okay. Here we go, we got a little bit more room and we have the ball bearing with a shoulder supporting the inner race. Now, now, what do you notice about uh, the size of the ball bearings? I mean, just from looking at the concept, can the ball bearings be the same size? Or you guys look at that. It may be obvious, but I want you to interact with me. Are, are these two ball bearings the same size? Okay, after that, so, so far we have ignored what the outside body is gonna look like. Let me, uh, let me bring this guy down there as well, because it is helpful. Okay. So guys, what did we, um, what could we, can you imagine doing all of this uh, as, as, as we used to just on paper with ink, uh, no computers, no touch screens, no uh, Microsoft OneNote. Can you imagine all of this? I mean, there were tremendous accomplishments back then, but I would be so frustrated <laughs> trying to engineer um, if I didn't have computers available to me. So let's see, you guys made some comments. Um, correct, the, the ball bearings don't look like they're the same size because there's a step, right? The one on top, there's another step. So the internal component uh, shown in black is kind of tapered, it's going in this direction. So the ball bearing on top is a little bit smaller. 
uh, correct the difference in the step sizes. Uh, Ernie, I don't see why you would you would order different size bearings. Make the step the same. Okay, so let's let's explore that. Uh, there is value in in reusing components in in designing something so that you use the same components rather than two different size components. Okay, so very good point. We definitely should explore that. Uh, for now, what we were doing is based on a very crude sketch on the left, we're adding a little bit more detail on the second sketch to the right. And this kind of thing starts to reveal itself. Well, could I use the same, same could I modify the geometry to have the same size bearings? So let's, let's spend a moment doing that. And Ernie, if you already have an idea, please type it in there. You, you guys are also welcome to jump in live. If you have a webcam and a mic, I would love it. Just jump in. Rather than typing, we can talk face to face, okay? That would be awesome. The platform supports, uh, I think, up to six people on at the same time. But let me give this some thought. So can we reconfigure so that we use the same ball bearing? First thing I would do, again, you're going to develop your own approaches. but one approach you might consider when this question arises. I find it to be fairly fast, actually. Uh, and that is, why don't I sketch it that way and see what it would take? So I am going to try to speed it up a little bit, but I want to get the point across here. So we have a little step. I'm going to skip all that other business. Uh, I could have copied the, the sketch, but I'm just going to do it this way. So uh, then, okay, we really don't know what's happening up there yet. We have a, a step for the inner race of a ball bearing. And ball bearing is right there. Okay, now the assumption is here we're going to impose a constraint on ourselves. We want to use the exact same size ball bearing. So let's sketch it that way, even though that's off scale. Sorry. All right. You impose a requirement. You drop it on paper or your Microsoft Surface Pro 3. And <laughs> what would it take to make that happen? We need to support the inner race and or and or the outer race somehow, right? Otherwise, it'll be sliding up and down. So I'll let you guys um, think about that. Okay, I have some ideas, but I I want to see you participate. If we use the same size ball bearing, how can we confine it? That's the word. How can we confine it in space? Okay. So think about that while I uh, start thinking about the housing on the outside. So now I'm talking about, so far we have paid no attention to this outside housing. We have to make sure that can be manufactured and that the whole thing can be assembled. So for now, will you guys think about the right, uh, how can we make that happen? Same size ball bearings. I'm gonna proceed in the middle working on the on the blue housing. Okay, so again, I'm gonna let the sketch on the left drive the evolved concept on the right in the middle of the screen. So now, um, thinking assembly, I am seeing this, at least the concept in the middle, we have a post, we slide a bearing, we slide the O-ring, another O-ring, and the bearing. Perhaps, perhaps the bearing at the end we don't pull, put in yet. We have to slide the housing downward to have it all come together. So since we're sliding the housing downward, the step for the outer racing would go this way. Okay. We know that much, or at least this is one of the infinite number of configurations. Uh, now, if I were if I were to keep going like this, like we did on the one on the left, we lose the seal, right? Um, I think that's 
pretty apparent, but I'm going to sketch it for you guys just in case you don't see that. Uh, here are the seals, but then we can go, we can, uh, the gas or liquid can, can sneak out. So that would be the purpose of the seals. <clears throat> oh, do you want to delete that one? <clears throat> so what that says is that uh, that the geometry in blue for the housing has to come toward the seals. Like this. Okay, at least on the left side. Oh, I did a, I, I did the 90 degree to the left. Okay, that doesn't matter though. Let me do the one on the right first. A little bit off scale. How can I? Huh. Sorry, you guys, but see, do you see what I'm running into? I, I didn't sketch it properly. So um, if I go this way, there's a problem right there. That problem right there. So I need more. Uh, more surface okay no one is saying anything about, uh how to make how to modify the geometry so we're the same size ball bearings do you have any suggestions while you think about that or keep thinking about that i need to do something about this so what i want to do since it's just a sketch i think i'm going to shrink these guys It's just a representation anyway, so it, it would be safe to do this. Okay, uh, larger eraser. Okay, so now I have a little bit more room to do what I need to do. So that way I can uh, represent it fairly. Uh, by the way, looking at this detail here, you might wonder why we don't just go straight to here. Uh, the reason we don't do that is because now you have that face of the housing. You have the step for the outer race of the bearing and then uh you happen to be in contact with the inner race at the same time so there's gonna be rubbing there's gonna be friction and you don't want that we uh that's not what we want in this particular case that is why there is a step here then another step to create some clearance right there uh. Where are my sketching abilities today? Okay. Making sense, you guys? I hope you're with me and uh, all of this is making sense. So now we go like that and we go up. Okay. I don't know, you guys. I'm pretty excited about this. Um, I think I would have loved to someone do this kind of thing in this level of detail when I was starting out. So, um, what else? Looking at the left, uh, we pass one seal and then uh, comes the channel, the passage at 90 degrees. And then we have the next seal. Okay, what happens? Well, we know that uh, at somewhere, probably somewhat coaxial to that. You know what I just remembered? How does this work? There's a line here. 
Huh. Okay. Maybe I'll try doing that. Um, okay. I'm stumbling along, huh? No one said anything about what I asked you guys. Okay. Um, so I could keep going from here. Uh, but do you guys see any issue, any any detail with what I've got so far? Well, about the passage. This is another another um, example of what happens when you draw something, and it seems very clear in your eyes, very clear whether you draw it or it's a CAD model seems very clear we have what i'm referring to in this particular case is um, we have a a vertical passage uh, and then we have a 90 degree turn right here and it just looks great right it looks like there's going to be flow through there but remember it's a rotary union what does that mean? The outside body is going to be rotating. The outside, uh, the body shown in blue is going to rotate, <clears throat> which means looking at it uh, three dimensionally, I haven't given you a dimension. I think, I, I, I hope you already visualize what this thing is starting, but just in case, This is sort of what we, the direction we're heading toward. Um, there's the flange. That's how it looks from the outside. There's going to be a port on the side. Right, so right now we're talking about flow comes in and somewhere in there it does a 90 degree turn. But it's going to be rotating so it's not always going to be aligned like that when the blue body rotates if you can visualize that when the blue body rotates uh you're going to get misalignment between the side port and it's going to look more like this once those two holes are not aligned i hope that makes sense so so we went from, let's say this is, this happens to be, uh, I don't know, 3 sixteenths of an inch diameter. Okay. But when, when it rotates, the only, the only way for the flow to go through, it's going to be through that very small, small clearance right there. Okay. You guys get that? I hope you get it. If you don't, I think this will make more sense in, in, in just a moment. Uh, so for that reason, we can't just go straight. We have to provide a relief. So over here, one of two, two things would happen. I'm going to do it on the black inside surface. So let's erase again. And... Again, see, now you can see that I, I was sketching sketching things way too close to them to each other. Get rid of that red one there. So this can happen. Give yourselves room when you sketch so that you know the issues I'm running into. Everything's too, too crammed together. But okay, here's the point. Um, we cannot go straight. We need to provide a relief. So I'm going to come in like this and same size. Oh, yeah. Well, that also has a hole going through. Uh, and the same, th this relief is, is, is like a groove all the way around. Oh, that's not good. Okay, so that relief will be there. Can you guys see that? So now 
it doesn't matter what the orientation of the blue part, blue part is, there is going to be a path leading up to the outlet or inlet. Good. All right, well, so we're making progress. Now, what's, what's next? Working our way upward on the housing, we have a ball bearing again. So now we can pretty much just mirror what we did underneath. But we do have to think about assembly. For now, I'm going to mirror it and then look at it and evaluate if there's an assembly issue. Okay, if we go like that. Is there an issue with assembly? Can we get that top ball bearing in there? Can we install the housing? Is that possible? Because see, we have two ball bearings kind of trapping the blue part. So the answer is there is a way to build this. Uh, first, you already probably figured it out. Uh, one potential assembly sequence would be uh, the body. Second, we can drop in the ball bearing, the lower ball bearing. Uh, third and fourth, the O-rings, I put a label on them, but you know there are O-rings there to be installed. Um, the housing, I'm just going to say third in this particular case. Well, I'll be accurate. Ball bearing, the O-rings are step three and four, so the housing would be five. If we drop that in before the top ball bearing, obviously, then we can drop in the upper ball bearing in there. Let's see, there's a question. You would have to install the top bearing last. Correct. Yep, you're right. Uh, okay. What else? So, so far it looks like it would work, okay? But there's so much more to say about this. But so far it looks like this approach in general would work. Now, how do we keep it all together? Because if we stop right there, it can fall apart. So how do we keep it together? There are a number of approaches. So now you can think of, um, let's ask ourselves the following, uh, what what needs to be held down? We have, oh, we'd probably want to close that, right? Otherwise, the flow will go right through. So let's say this is the end of a drill bit, which you wouldn't just drill it. It, it would also be reamed and other things. But let's say this. What we have right there, it can fall apart. What component needs to be held? Component or components need to be confined so that this design doesn't fall apart. Let's see, the housing coming in last would make sense, but I'm still thinking about what could possibly go wrong. That's your point. I'm sorry I didn't see your message on time. I don't know what I was saying that you're agreeing with, but let's see, the housing coming in last would make sense, but I'm still thinking about what could possibly go wrong. Okay, so I think you figured it out, but let's say the housing came in last. It wouldn't be able to, right? Because the upper ball bearing is in the way. So I think that's what you realized. Okay, uh, flange on the bottom is to hold housing. I would use clamp bolts. Oh, okay, okay. I think you're you're talking about securing the entire um, um, ro rotary union. 
because I think you're referring to this flange down here, right? So yes, that, that's going to have to be retained, uh, attached to what, whatever. Uh, you're absolutely right. But what I'm asking about is the ball bearing, as, as etched, the ball bearing, the blue housing can just slide out. It can slide out. We need something to keep the rotary unit itself together. Okay, so let, I'll give you guys a moment to think about that. And let me jump on the right now. If we wanted to have the same size ball bearings. It certainly affects the design. Uh, let's see, what is, I'm jumping around a little bit guys, but I'm giving you an opportunity to think about things, okay? So what is needed with this ball bearing? We need a step, we need a shoulder to locate it. Uh, and that's what we were doing on the one on the left, right? However, if we want them to be the same size, we have to change the geometry, but we still need that shoulder for the inner race. So one thing we could do is uh, add a retaining ring. We use a different color. Uh, what's a good color? Purple, is that purple? We could add a retaining ring right there. That's one way to do it. So there will be a groove and a retaining ring that provides the seat or the or the shoulder for the inner race of the ball bearing. I'll show you some pictures in a moment. All right. Okay, no one said anything else. <clears throat> so, so we're talking about retaining uh, the whole thing together so that the components don't slide out, okay? So basically, the question was, which component or components are the ones that actually need to be held in place? Let's let's see. If we hold, uh, if we just hold the blue housing in place, can anything fall apart? If we just find a way to constrain the blue housing axially, it's already bottomed out. It cannot go any lower, right? Because we have the ball bearing at the bottom and the inner and outer rays and those two shoulders. So we can no longer slide it downward, but we could slide it up. So let's say we prevent the uh, housing from sliding up. Is that sufficient? The answer is, in my opinion, no. The housing, the, the, the O-rings and the bottom ball bearing would be fine but the upper ball bearing can still slide up. Nothing is holding that one in place. So we explored, explored that. Let's explore something else. What if we hold down, hold the top bearing down? Is that sufficient to keep everything from falling apart? And we would hold it down by the inner race. If we're pushing down on it, can the blue housing slide up? Ernie's saying uh, yes, but I think you were saying yes to something I said a moment ago, so <laughs> I didn't look up quickly enough. Um, so in this case, if we hold down on the inner race of, of the top bearing, it looks like the blue housing will be trapped it will not be able to slide up anymore. Let me know if you agree. So to that end, uh, just used, uh, or I considered using um, a retaining ring right there. We, we could have a groove over here. Uh, where's black? We could add a groove and add a routine ring right there. That would trap everything. Uh, as far as I can tell, unless I'm missing something, let me know if I'm missing anything. 
Okay. So I think you can see how the, the, this, the, this concept development process is working out. I should have labeled uh, these two lectures last week and this week, concept development from scratch, instead of let's collaborate on Onshape and do it all together, because obviously uh, I didn't anticipate how long it would take to address this in detail. I think we can still get on Onshape, but we're probably not going to finish the, the day. Most likely we will. But uh, I like what we're doing right now. I hope you do as well. Okay, so let's let's evaluate where we are. We started on the left with a very crude sketch. Just drop some things in there. What components are needed in general? What kind of configuration it may take? Okay. And this is just the initial attempt. Uh, if you've been with me long enough, you know that I encourage that you come up with three to five different ways to do the same thing. So here we barely barely have one concept only. I guarantee you we can, if we spend another two hours working on this, we can come up with three to five variations of this. So when you're designing something, you would actually do that. Come up with three to five pros and cons are going to reveal themselves. Give me a moment, you guys. I need a little bit of water. I'm sorry. Give me just one sec. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. I actually got dizzy for a moment. I haven't had anything to eat today. I think that's why. So if you saw my eyes roll and my head go like this, it's because <laughs> I was getting dizzy for a moment. Um, let's see. Let's get back to this. So Ernie's asking, um, does anyone have them with the O-rings rubbing against the housing during use? Oh, you were asking the, the group maybe while I was away? Um, the O-ring rubbing against the housing during use. So here's the thing. Um, see, remember that there are static applications and there are dynamic applications. So here we have a dynamic application. There's components moving in relation to each other. So the seal, it's material, it's it has the gland design, everything is going to be uh, this, uh, selected and specified so that it, it works well for a rotary dynamic application. So rubbing against the seal here is on purpose, it's intentional, and it is designed to do that. If it was static application, a static application, it would be different, a different case. In this case, everything we're gonna do, all the details, the material selection, all that is gonna be relevant to a dynamic rotary application. So there, there will definitely be rubbing against the seal and that is intentional. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I was going over the basic steps and reviewing where we are. Very crude sketch on the left, throw the components in there that you're gonna need lay them out fairly quickly, just get an idea, a rough, very rough idea of what this thing may look like. Even though you, you already know you're gonna come up with three to five additional designs, you gotta start somewhere. Then you evolve that sketch uh, a little bit more detail, like how would actual parts actually fit? Uh, what standard components might you use? Might you use? Um, also, can I use the same size? so that I don't have two different sizes of ball bags or two different size O-rings, etc. You You start to keep that in mind as you uh, evolve the concept. Is evolve a verb? I hope so. Um, you're adding more and more detail. Also, one thing we haven't done so far because we didn't define it. Uh, at this point, you're welcome, Bernie. At this point, uh, you would, we would already know a little bit about the design requirements. Again, if you've been with me for a while, or if you took the uh, one of the certificate programs, if you went through them, uh, there's there's a detailed 
um, Cognetics Process of Mechanical Design Excellence, uh, which is just in general, good practice. One of the major steps is understanding what the need is in as much detail as possible and defining some uh, requirements. So in this particular case, we didn't do that, but let's say we all know it's gonna be 10 PSI is what we need. Um, and let's say it's for trucks working underground in mining equipment, a very rough, dirty environment. So dirty environment, perhaps just, just saying that right there. Uh, if it's a dirty environment, for example, this space here is wide open. So dirt and, excuse me, dirt and debris is going to get in there. So we would not want that. So for that, for that reason, if we know this is for a dirty environment, we would probably enclose it. It would make more sense probably to enclose it. Um, but look, as soon as we do that, let me, let me do that a little bit better. As soon as we enclose it like that, and let's say the housing is more of a cup that slides over, what happens? The, the approach falls apart. How do you get that top ball bearing in there if the housing is one piece? Um, how do you get that retaining ring in there? So uh, some, some problems would arise. Okay. But anyway, the point is we're working right now without any requirements in mind. So you would want those requirements ahead of time so that you don't go down the road, the wrong road, wasting your time. Another thing, if it's a very rough environment, maybe regular ball bearings are not going to do the job. Maybe the blue housing is going to experience a lot of forces. In, in which case um, you would make a preliminary, um, let's see, give me a sec. I can't type and talk and think at the same time. Um, I'm gonna look for double row uh, ball bearings. Depending on the forces that this thing is gonna be exposed to, you may determine that you need more robust bearings, maybe double row bearings. Um, okay, things like that. So, all right. The other thing is, some things that I would evaluate here. I would not, first of all, like I said, I'm gonna reiterate this once again come up with three to five ways of, to do this, of doing the same thing. One of the, I'm gonna call it a flaw because I think it is a flaw. One of the major flaws I see, I've seen in my, uh, my career from other engineers and perhaps even myself at the beginning is uh, some engineers come up with a, uh, the first design that they come up with they tweak it and they make it work and they stick to that and, and they pursue it, they prototype it, it ends up in production. Um, what happens is if we only choose our initial design and we stick to it and we make it work and you don't force yourself to think uh, of another two to four concepts that would accomplish the same objective, you may be overlooking some huge benefits. Maybe concept number four is significantly better because of whatever reason but you didn't give yourself the opportunity to get there okay so one of my biggest advice uh pieces of advice for you is, is do not just choose your initial concept and make it work force yourself to come up with more concepts okay uh ernie or search is saying i see ernie but our biggest concern our biggest concern would be temperature change due to friction. So this is in regard to the comment of the O-ring rubbing against housing. So again, uh, if this is a high temperature application or a cold environment or cold and hot, cold and hot, something like that, that also is going to drive some elements of the design. Uh, material selection, uh, you would start looking at uh, thermal expansion of the material. For example, the metal. 
let's say the black piece, the, the black internal piece is metallic, it's going to expand at a different rate than the blue housing, if the blue housing is a different material. Things like that. I think that's, that's kind of what Serge is pointing out. Okay. Uh, anyway, one thing I would look at right now, first thing I would want to review is other ways to retain uh, this, to keep the assembly together. For now, we used, I went with the initial uh, retaining ring approach. So let's do this. First thing, let's look at what retaining rings are in case you're not familiar with those. <clears throat> and then explore other ways uh, to make that work. So here you see the retaining rings. Uh, you can see the various geometries. And each different type of retaining ring has a different tool uh, or method of installation and removal, as you can see. Okay, but they're basically rings uh, that you that you install over a groove on a shaft. Okay, so let me let's see. Ah, look at that. Let's look at this one here. There you go. This is almost what we have. So in this design, there's a ball bearing, and you can see a retaining ring right there. Uh, ho uh, holding the inner race in place. The other thing you see there is the tool. They're about to remove it or they just installed it. Okay. So that's, that's the initial concept that I came up with. However, there are infinite numbers of ways to keep that inner race in place. So let's see if... So... I could sketch them. You would probably sketch them. Okay, another another step. I'm jumping around a little bit, but another step that's important. Uh, <clears throat> in the sequence of design that I suggest, usually, usually, there are exceptions, but usually, is to come up with your own ideas. Do your own brainstorming first. Then you have to do your, what is it called, due diligence. You have to do be responsible and also explore, not only come up with your own approaches and your own brainstorming sessions, but you have to see what already exists. What are existing ways of doing this? Before, you know, maybe it doesn't make sense to reinvent the wheel in this case. So you have to brainstorm first. I like doing that before I explore existing approaches so that my my mind is free to roam around and explore without limitations, without being influenced by pictures that I already saw, things like that. And then after brainstorming, I, I do, I look at, okay, how are people currently doing this? This is not a new thing. Somebody else must have designed ways to retain uh, ball bearings on a shaft. So that's what we're gonna do now, real quick. Um, let's see. I wonder, I'm just going to type in ball bearing retention methods. <clears throat> See what comes up with those keywords. Okay. And we are getting some hits here. So if you look at this one here, let's see. You see the ball bearing right there on the inside. So on the left side, on the inner race, there they have a sleeve that's supporting the inner race on the left side. Uh, the outer race on top is got a is got a shoulder uh, for the outer race on the right side, and it's got a retaining ring for the outer race shown on the left side. Now, what about the other corner? The inner race on the right side. I see, they have a washer supporting the inner race. Bearing retaining collar. Oh, I see what that is. Okay, it's a, it's a collar, a collar that slides on 
and you see on the bottom uh, there's a threaded uh, threaded hole uh, perpendicular going up like this so it's a collar with a threaded hole <clears throat> in that threaded hole you put a you tighten a set screw so that's how they're doing it in this particular case let me show you that real quick uh let's look at mcmaster such as this guy they're, they have it on a drill bit in this case but you see it's just a sleeve a collar and a set screw at 90 degrees that's what they're doing here okay so i probably would not like that it seems a little bit loose and it can still fall apart and again if it's a rough environment that set screw is going to start sliding out and the thing the thing is going to fail so the so i would probably not use that approach uh for this particular hypothetical application um what i was looking for is a threaded approach to show you aha such as this oh Look at that, I think there are three ways to do it here. So figure 11, all the way to the right, looks like a retaining ring. We've already covered that one. <clears throat> Nine and 10. Oh, I see what they're doing. Okay, let's look at nine first on the left. Um, now you see the shaft is threaded and you slide in a, a knob and that is holding the inner race in place. Uh, on the right side, uh, figure in the middle, figure 10, they're just showing that um, on the left, you can have a threaded collar or knot that holds the inner race in place. And on the right side, they have sort of a washer held in place, located by a some type of retaining ring on the shaft. Okay. Let's see. Uh, okay, sir, I am leaving. I have to go. Don't go. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Please inform in the next class if you say anything more important about dates or about when to start. Yeah, my apologies. I was supposed to make an announcement on that. Um, you're welcome. I'm sorry you have to leave, Conrad. Please let me know when you guys leave. Where do you guys leave off? Okay, my pleasure. Take care, you guys. Uh, I understand, and you're welcome to leave if you need to. All right. Where are we at then? Any questions or suggestions? <clears throat> so the original proposal, I think, was to design a two-port um, two um, rotary union. So I think we can easily sort of easily see how this could evolve into two ports it would have to be longer another pair of o-rings perhaps or at least one more o-ring i would use another pair to to really isolate those two fluids or, or uh, gases um another ball bearing no not necessarily it would just get longer right and we would copy what we did in the middle to add another passage